Okay, everybody, welcome back to the accommodation show. I'm pumped for today's episode because we've got someone joining us from Marriott International. We've got Richard Crawford on the line. Welcome. Hi, Bart. Good to be with you. Look, um, we've been in touch and we've been talking all things hotel development, franchising, loyalty programs and all the wonderful things you guys do over at Marriott. Um, I'm excited today because we're going to add some questions about loyalty programs and why they're incredibly important um, for um, hotel businesses uh, right now and into the future and sort of a bit of their evolution and that sort of thing. Um, and you're uh, someone that's going to impart a lot of knowledge. So uh, excited for that. But before we get going, I'd love you to introduce yourself, let everybody know um, who you are, where, you, where you're from um, and what you get up to in your day to day. Well, thank you, Bart, for the introduction. Good to be with you. Uh, well, I won't start at the very beginning, but I'll, I'll give you a quick synopsis. So uh, I head up hotel development for Marriott International, which is the world's largest hotel company. Uh, my remit is about 12 countries. So I'm based in Australia and I look after Australia, New Zealand and the Pacific as far east as uh, Tahiti. So I'm, I happily look after Bora Bora and islands like that. <laughs> Uh, it is, it's a big job uh, because our growth mandate is, is probably the, the highest strategic priority for our business. We're a Wall Street company. We've been around 95 years. Mr. Marriott has just stepped down as chairman. Uh, he's, he's the second chairman in the 95 years and his son, David, has just stepped up to be the third chairman. So I've been with the company six years. Uh, it's, it's just a wonderful place uh, to be. It is right now sort of the eye of the storm in many ways. We're, we're, we um, have experienced some tough times because of COVID, but uh, hotel development is just rampant right now. So we're, we're growing at a rapid rate. We're opening a hotel still every 14 hours somewhere in the world, uh, which is a remarkable run rate. Uh, my work before I joined Marriott was very much in private enterprise. So um, I had, had uh, my own businesses in Tasmania, where I'm from. Uh, I owned what was Australia's most awarded hotel. That's how I got into hotels. I knew nothing about them, by the way, uh, but uh, I owned the Henry Jones Art Hotel, which um, I developed as one of Australia's first boutique hotels and a trading art gallery. And I coined a phrase, um, black tie service with a blue jeans attitude. And the whole uh, ethos of that was to keep it real because I was kind of anti-chains, ironically. Uh, I, I felt that hotels needed to be, to be shaken up a little bit, and we did that. Uh, I was only 28 or 30 at the time and then uh, the owners of the casinos knocked on my door and made me a compelling offer and said we want to buy your hotel. My heart said no, my, my accountant said yes. Uh, so I sold, took a couple of years off and um, it was actually about to go into politics. I had a safe seat in the state election and um, my dad said stop, you, you've never lived outside of Tasmania, you've never had a job. Uh, there's a big world out there. You should probably go and see if corporate world is for you because that might be something you regret you didn't try. And uh, so I did that and uh, I've loved every moment of it. And as I said, working for a Wall Street company gives me, I feel a greater sense of achievement in many ways doing that than I did when I owned six companies at one point in time with hundreds of staff and, um, and different interests across Tasmania. So. Uh, it's been a change of life for me, Bart, and a really exciting one. That's beautiful. I love that story, and I love that you have the the hotel history, right, and kind of building it from the ground up and understanding exactly how a business works before you get into um, working for such a huge company such as Marriott. So you've kind of lived it and breathed it, and you can understand and empathize with what it actually takes to run a hotel um, all the way through now to actually how to, I guess, make money out of out of um, out of running hotels, which is which is crucial. I didn't know that you uh, you were on the verge of politics. That's something that's, that came up yes. new today. So um, look, I, I might have dodged a bullet there, but um, you know. But at the time, you know, in Tasmania, they say when you've made it in business, you do one of two things: you either go into politics or you buy a vineyard. <laughs> and uh, I wasn't really into wine, and and politics was an, uh, just an, an something I was interested in, but. I, I couldn't have predicted that uh, making that decision and, and leaving the island would, would take me to where I am today. And uh, yeah, so sometimes you just never know. But I, I was actually scared. My private enterprise background, I felt would hold me back because I thought I was a one trick pony. I thought that I, I was good at mm. doing stuff for myself and my family business and keeping dad happy in retirement. Uh, but how would that translate to a corporate environment? And I think a lot of your listeners and viewers who are small business people and owner operators, 
are in the grind of, of their business and and that's where you feel comfortable but also um, it's familiar right because that's what you do you get up early you go to bed late and you work on your business does that translate to a, a company with 800,000 people in it mm. and you know it, it can and I, I promised myself I would stay true to those entrepreneurial roots and when I do deals that's what I call on every single day and there's only a hundred of me around the world interestingly those though we have 800,000 people there's only a hundred of me and Marriott dotted around the world with a remit to grow our 30 brands and most of those guys they all come and girls come from different backgrounds a lot of them are lawyers because it's very transactional what we do um, a lot come from not many from hotel space actually but sort of more financial or legal background and I, I just come from this sort of down and dirty small business background and I didn't know whether it would fit but um, so far so good I, I would... I imagine that the entrepreneurial spirit is incredibly important and that's what's got you to, I guess, hang around and to provide value to Marriott. Yeah, I think they took a punt on me, but to be honest, um, I, I, I didn't expect they flew out from Hong Kong. It happened when your hotel people will remember a company called Starwood, which was Sheraton, W, St. Regis. Well, Marriott International bought Starwood in 2016, the biggest hotel transaction in the history of the world, $14 billion transaction. And Marriott realized that they needed someone all of a sudden in this part of the world. Um, the guy that was previously looking after this was doing it from Hong Kong. And as we all know, Australians are very parochial. So a guy flying in from Hong Kong uh, to try and do a hotel deal and disappearing for three months, six months, uh, I, I don't think was the right uh, structure and the company to their credit identified that and then uh, sought me out flew out from Hong Kong said we'd like to talk to you we've heard a little bit about you uh, and I, I I thought that um, my lack of experience in corporate world would work against me but uh, my boss said no no we need that entrepreneurial spirit if we're going to grow at the rate that that our shareholders expect us to when you're a Wall Street company you're heavily scrutinized and that the, the price is a cracker uh, they they saw that as, as an advantage um, so so I think I, I was lucky that they had that outlook at the time sure, and, and I imagine that uh, when you go into corporate it's a lot harder to break rules um, because you need that structure in place so that everything works and then it functions in a certain way but then the entrepreneur and you will be fighting against that and trying to make changes and be a little bit more scrappy as you mentioned before and, <laughs> yeah. and, and to get things done right to get things over the line where if you're used to sort of that rigidity then you, you can't make that that progression or that development within the business and, and make the, the those real strides forward uh, and break things basically yeah and I think Marriott, to Marriott's credit they, they have put a lot of thought into the structure of the organization and, and we're, we're a matrix organization when you have so many people in it you have to be uh, so the disciplines are very well defined and there is there is overlap of course with development and legal and, and our design guys and of course our operations guys but development is is almost quarantined and said to one side by design to make sure that we are nimble enough uh, to get out there and do deals with hotel owners and developers to hopefully put our brands on, on those buildings. Uh, and, I, and I think, um, to Marriott's credit, when you've been around 95 years, you, you've had time to finesse the structure of the organisation appropriately. And we learn all the time. <clears throat> but there's one thing I've learned through our success in recent years is acting local and behaving local is so important, even though you might be a global organisation. You have to be very in tune with um, the local macro environment, but also the people on the ground. Uh, so it's difficult to do that if you're based in another country. And um, I, I think the structure we've got here is is proving to be a successful one. Yeah, beautiful. So the so for everyone that's listening, um, one of the things I was very conscious of um, before I started talking to Richard was that when you're opening a hotel every 14 hours. When you have as many brands as Marriott does, there's just so many topics that we could potentially talk about today and and say, oh, where can we get the most value and sort of provide it back um, and without becoming a, a sales pitch either, because I don't think that that's of much value to, to anyone at this particular moment. Um, but there's so much to be learned. And when we talked before, you had, you had started teaching me different things about how things are arranged and how things are done. Now, um, uh, there's is it 30 brands how many brands are there at Marriott right now yeah yeah for our sins uh, 30 brands so when Marriott bought Starwood effectively uh, 17 brands 
bolted on 13 brands to become 30. Sounds like a lot, right? You know, and a lot of people would question whether you need 30. The, the reality is you absolutely do need 30 brands. When you have 8,000 hotels, uh, of course, they're defined, and you know, I hate to use an Americanism, but it's an American company. Swim lanes are really important for 30 brands. And it's not, it's not curious or unusual that you would need 30 brands to cover 8,000 hotels because we're in the luxury space, the upper upscale space, the upscale space, and the upper mid-scale space. So you need that. And of course, at the end of the day, we're a brand organization. Um, customers go to hotels often because of the name that's on the door. We have rusted on you know, Ritz-Carlton um, loyal guests, or St. Regis, or Sheraton, or W for the, for the people that are perhaps fun seekers and, and want a bit more energy. So each one of those brands allows us to offer something different um, in different locations. But the other thing is, when you have such a large footprint, uh, when we do deals with hotel owners and developers, we, we give an area of protection. So um, you know, if we give a five kilometre or 10 kilometre radius around a Sheraton or a Marriott hotel, it means we can't do another one of those brands in that same area. So we need another brand in order to grow our footprint. And the, the ultimate measure of success there would be a couple of cities. New York, for example, New York City, we have 100 plus hotels in a 10K radius of Times Square. And in Shanghai, we just opened our 50th hotel. And that, that is, um, for us, uh, success because with 30 brands, we're able to plan different hotels that behave differently and appeal to different demographics uh, operating together alongside each other in one city. So. Uh there are quite a few operators that have massive branding issues um, where they've got uh, their portfolio of properties or uh, that they manage. It's kind of disparate. Um, uh, joining them by one brand, it kind of doesn't make sense. And what I always kind of tend to, to lean towards is to say, hey, you need to focus on the avatar and the customer and who you're targeting and what that, that journey is for them. And then that will help dictate what brand you want on the other side of it. Um, but then what you can do, and this is what Marriott does, is Marriott is the, the pillar in the middle of it all with the Marriott brand promise. So no matter which of the brands you stay with, you're still protected by Marriott's core values, the, 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 the mothership on there. Is that how, how Marriott sees itself? Yeah, it does, but So the, the, the mothership is Marriott International, which is in Bethesda in, in America. That's where Mr. Marriott's office is and, and you know, 3,000 people in our headquarters. The, the company culture starts from there. Uh, it was born 95 years ago. It's developed there. But as you grow and spread your footprint around the world, uh, the, the core uh, fabric of the organization very much is embedded uh, in, in that headquarter scenario. Uh, we then make a promise, of course, as you say, to our guests. And we have a million guests every night in our care. Uh, that's a big responsibility, which we take very, very seriously. Everything from you know, fire life safety to you know, guest amenities, all of those things for a million people every single night. Now, we think that there's a, a huge, we know there's a huge cohort of people that are attracted to the security assurances, particularly in today's world. Uh, the safety and the hygiene factors are really important. And they associate that not just with our company, but of course with with a lot of international brands that have put a lot of resources, time, energy, and thought into taking care of our guests. And when you go to one of our hotels uh, with, uh, with that promise attached, that gives people a lot of, a lot of comfort. Uh, corporate organizations that are responsible for putting their guests in hotels uh, know that we have um, very strong mandates on all those fronts. So, so yes, there is a promise, and, and I think our guests value that. The antithesis of that, of course, is the person that might be attracted to, you know, I'm going to say generation one Airbnb, who, who said, well, actually, I don't need all those assurances. I, I, I don't need a brand. I'm happy just to rock up and grab a bed. And there's everything in between now. Now, to Airbnb's credit, they're a lot more sophisticated uh, than they were when they first started. And their, their market cap uh, tells you that they are a behemoth. They are the biggest hotel company in the world. In, in, by some measure, it measures, not all measures. Uh, so, so the guest, not every guest values the, the promise that we, we, we understand that, but by and large, we know that um, most of our guests keep coming back again and again. Uh, the glue that holds it all together is our 
Marriott Bonvoy loyalty program, which has, believe it or not, 160 million members globally. What a, what a great segue, Richard. You can see where I was going with all of this. <laughs> so, um, right. So one of the things I think that I just want to just kind of close off that, that, that brand that kind of sits in the middle and those promises. And I think that that's something that I'm constantly rattling on about just saying, Hey, uh, don't be afraid to have multiple brands within your business. You might, uh, it kind of goes against what marketing sort of, uh, what marketers sort of say is that, you know, all, you have to be one thing, represent all this to everybody. It doesn't really work in accommodation because different groups of people have different needs, but you can uh, bind it all together with uh, a, a promise of some sort, which is, which is something that Marriott has done. And there's other organizations that are doing it very well, but it is a, it's a fair amount of work to get to that particular point. But I guess what I'm saying is don't be afraid to look at your portfolio and whatever you're doing and say, I need to split this up a bit. I need to have separate brands. Um, and you don't have to lose, there doesn't have to be so much additional cost by building out extra brands. That's what I'm saying. Um, you can do it, yeah, you can I, do it I, in I a very that. tidy manner. Yeah, I agree. I, I think I think you need both. Uh, but when I say both, I'm talking about this overarching uh, set of values, culture, all of the things that people in business understand. And that, that for us is Married International's sort of um, footprint, if you like it, what we're known for. But beneath that, there's got to be brands that take us into different places. One brand only will limit your growth. And, and I'm not suggesting for a moment that, that everyone has the capacity or even the desire to, to be the biggest in the world. Or, but, but I do know that every time uh, I look at an opportunity, even though I have 30 brands, there might only be one or two brands that matches that opportunity. And if I didn't have that at my disposal, it would go to one of our competitors. Uh, because airport hotels are different to island resorts, are different to CBD, big box hotels. Uh, they, they, they are all different beasts that need to have a market response that's intelligent and that suits the building, the location, the market demographic. One brand can never do that. Um, for 8,000 hotels. You might get away with it with 100 hotels, say, or even the Sheraton brand, which now has 440 hotels. That's a lot of hotels for one brand, but we can't take Sheraton everywhere because it does not belong everywhere. And where it doesn't belong, we'll put another brand. It might be a Ritz-Carlton Reserve on an exotic island in my patch off Bora Bora, for example. So without that breadth of brands, we, we are limiting ourselves. At a smaller scale, you know, a hotel company might have three brands only, but even three would give you a lot of variation to get into self-contained accommodation or um, boutique or lifestyle. I hate the word, but it's commonplace in our, in our industry. Um, so, so even adding at one more string to your bow, and I'm not saying you have to have 30 like us, but it does open up a whole new world of opportunity and growth if growth is part of your strategic mandate. Yeah, yeah. And then, uh, but you would say that it's imperative to have the the mothership at the top that kind of the, that links it all together. So from a branding and marketing perspective, and so that guests understand that they're getting extra value by also being having that sort of protection from the top. Yeah, I, I think so. And for us, the manifestation of that is, is Marriott Bonvoy, because even if you stay at a Ritz-Carlton, a Sheraton, a Moxie, uh, a Western, any of our brands, all roads lead to your Marriott Bonvoy profile, where you get points for your loyalty. Uh, and that, that to us is the, the piece that really brings it all together to make sure that our customers, whether they're traveling on business or for pleasure, uh, know that uh, they, whichever one of those brands they're staying with, they get the full benefits of the assurances we talked about, but also those points and the loyalty and the recognition. It's not just about racking up points, it's about whichever hotel you walk into of ours, uh, saying, Mr. Crawford, nice to see you again, welcome back. We note that your status of your married bonvoy is this, and for that you, you get certain benefits on your stay. And that recognition, um, when, particularly when you're away from home on the road, um, is something we know people really value. And that's why Marriott, we say, we're obsessed with loyalty. Uh, I'm quoting the boss there, Mr. Marriott. Uh, we are obsessed with loyalty because we know that it works. And uh, that, that is really the foundation of, of our recent growth and about of our, probably our next 10 years of, of growth for the, for the business. Yeah, and there, there's, there's more and more companies that are moving into that space and getting very aggressive in terms of uh, 
the way that they roll out their loyalty programs and what they're actually offering within their loyalty programs that well, you're staying at a hotel and all of a sudden you're, you're ordering food and, and that's part of the loyalty program and you're buying credit cards and petrol and, and whatever else. So that's a, a really fascinating space which is kind of growing there. But um, let's just, uh, can you give us a bit of a breakdown um, for those that don't know, you started mentioning some numbers around how big this loyalty program actually is. Um, can you give us a bit more about it? And then what I'd love you to do or where I'd like to move towards is, is those key benefits uh, to Marriott of having the loyalty program? Because you say we can talk about our oh, loyalty is great, people rebook and that sort of thing. But w what, what does it mean to the brand um, uh, to, to Marriott as a whole? Yeah, it's, it's one of our most valuable, um, I'll call it pieces of IP, but, it, but it's more than that. It, it's, it's the central pillar now of, of, of our business. And the reason for this is that every time we open a hotel, we know that within probably months, 50% of room occupancy on any given night will come from our loyalty members, which is an amazing statistic. It, what it does is it, it gives uh, it underpins and, and, and safeguards the business in its early ramp up time to know that we've got this ready made cohort of customers that will follow our brands. So it's important to remember that, that Marriott is essentially a branding company. So we manage hotels and we franchise hotels. Somebody owns the building, somebody else owns the building and the enterprise. So when I'm pitching to, to, to win ahead of our competitors, Marriott Bonvoy is central to that because I use that 50% statistic and say to the hotel owner, we know that we will have 50% of your room occupancy coming from 160 million loyal members. And that is a very powerful statement to say that plugging in, we talk about plugging into the Marriott system delivers uh, immense benefit in terms of sales, marketing, distribution. But I think increasingly loyalty is the number one. So, so the, the, the numbers, mean something. It's not necessarily the, the fact that we have 160 million mm -hmm. of them, it's how engaged they are. Mm -hmm. They actually spend more money uh, than, than non-members. They stay longer than non-members because they value the experience with us and all the while they're being recognized. The recognition and the reward that they get isn't just room upgrades and, and, and you know maybe a free cocktail or whatever it might be. You know, recently I, I know um, I say recently, it's probably a couple of years ago now, a re very regular corporate guest of ours saved up all of his Marriott Bonvoy points, not to use on upgrades, but to have a special moment. And that was to have a game of tennis with Andy Roddick at Flushing Meadows on Centre Court. You know, what an experience. And that's a money can't buy loyalty experience that we can give to our guests that perpetuates their attachment to our brands. And our association with Formula One, um, with Man United, with the Australian Open here in Australia. Uh, you know, we have a corporate box where our, our, our tier one members will meet Ash Barty and touch the trophy. I mean, you know, this is amazing. This is amazing stuff. This is well beyond a room upgrade on check-in. This is where the ultimate loyalty experience takes you. And uh, we, we're just getting better at it all the time. We get excited about it because we see how excited our guests are. Now, that, that's a global loyalty system, right, mm. which is which is really big and, 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 and I don't want it to sound like it's out of reach because there are learnings from this for every single person in business. If you own one hotel with 20 rooms, you can do a version of that. You know, it might not be offering up Andy Roddick for a game of tennis, but, but there are things you can do in-house at the desk and as follow-up to make sure that that guest um, wants to come back to, to your establishment because of that recognition. And perhaps it's something you do by touching them later on with something in the mail or an email. You know, I'm a bit old school, starting to, to realize that I'm 50 this year, so I've, I feel like I'm straddling old school and, and trying to keep up with what's coming next. But I, I you know, a note in the mail, a note in the mail from someone uh, to say, look, really great, thanks for staying with us, can't wait to see you next time. When you do come back, um, you know, there's a, there's a drink on me or something like that. And I'm getting really granular, but my point is it doesn't have to be this giant sophisticated Marriott Bonvoy machine to deliver the same um, feeling and emotion because that's, that's where the magic happens. When someone has an emotive response to your product and to your hotel, in this case, uh, that is success. Yeah, beautiful. So um, I think that's a really important point, the it being out of reach, right? So. Um, if we build a hotel, if we get sort of within the Marriott system, then great. If our listeners, there'll only be 
<laughs> dozens of people that will listen to this show that will potentially ever be in that position to own a hotel, right? Um, but that, uh, but then we've got you know thousands of people that are listening that that do have accommodation that are in the space, and then they'll they'll be listening to this going, ah, oh, loyalty program, let's do yeah. something. And in my experience, it's very hard to the the perception of what it needs to be is I needed to have uh, points. It needs to work like Qantas or Marriott Bonvoy. I need to have all these points and then different tiers. And then I need to offer all these things. But then you find that getting that engagement with the person just falls over because they don't stay often enough um, or this sort of issue. So uh, loyalty doesn't have to be driven by points as such. You can do it by doing exactly what you said, by sending a letter, recognizing someone that stayed with you over a certain number of times, uh, recognizing when someone's booked a longer stay and saying, hey, okay, you've done this. Um, for your loyalty, I am prepared to do, to, to, to do that. So um, getting customer data is, I think, crucial if you are going to have some sort of loyalty type um, system so that you know who your customers are because you're not going to remember it all. You need, you need the data so that you can see them coming back and then encourage them to come back and to stay loyal to you. Are there any other tips that you would have that might, it's kind of going against what you do, but but that might fit in that you guys have learned and say, hey, how, how else can we sort of start some sort of loyalty system with with our guests? And let's say it is uh, two or three ho small hotels or, or, or 30 keys or something like that. Yeah, look, I mean, you talked about, you, you said the word recognition and, and that, that's, that's got to be the essence of what a loyalty program is about. Um, reward is definitely part of it, you know, the points thing. But we all remember, you know, in the 90s when everyone's wallet was full of meaningless loyalty cards. Everyone was handing them out. Whichever shop you went to, we're going to give you a loyalty card. And people, it just became ridiculous because most of these programs were not personal. People didn't feel engaged or um, that, that emotion that I mentioned before. So, so I think, first of all, it's got to be meaningful. Capturing data is the starting point. You have to know, you have to have a system that recognizes who your most profitable prospects are, your most regular guests are, so that the system tells you this is their 10th day, this is their 10th night, or this is their 100th night. And you know we have many, many of our loyalty members who are with us 100 nights a year. Uh, it's a long time to be away from home. Those people, need, we need to know that. Our system needs to be telling people at check-in that this is that person. Uh, so any system can do it. You can use an Excel spreadsheet if you have to, or a piece of paper, but you know, you've got to start with this premise that, that knowing who the person is when they walk in the door. Uh, and we all have experiences in retail. Uh, we go back to the same place time and time again, uh, or hospitality venues even, and we're not recognized. After the fourth, fifth, 10th time, um, you want to be recognized, but, but they don't have systems in place because retail is, that, is so transactional that they're probably not focusing on the number of times the same person comes back mm. because in a shopping center, they're focused on the million people that are in the center. I think the answer lies in the intimacy of it. And if you are a small hotel, there is, you are probably in a better position than, than a busy retailer in the middle of a shopping center to capture and understand that guest because you're the one eyeballing them and you should have systems that, are, that can be basic, but definitely understand who that person is. Then the journey starts. What, what will you do once you've got that information? Of course, there are some technical issues. You have to have authority to communicate with them by, um, you know, privacy law says that we have to do that. That's easy to do. That's a ticking of the box. Um, and then you can engage with them in a way that can be as simple as free Wi-Fi if you're not already doing it um, for, for a member or for someone that's recognized as being one of your most regular guests. And I think that free Wi-Fi is actually a good example. That, that's where most loyalty programs started. It's like, hey, sign up and uh, you'll get free Wi-Fi on your, on your first day. Now, that's kind of a, a given now, right? Uh, but that was one way people, people captured information and made people engage with the hotel or the company so that they were attached. Once you've got them attached, the opportunities are endless. And as I said, whether it's a note in the mail from a bed and breakfast <laughs> to say thanks for your 10th stay, or whether it's that huge reward of the game of tennis with Andy Roddick or a box at the Australian Open um, hospitality, then everything in between is up for grabs. Use your imagination. 
But I always say, think of yourself as the customer. How do you feel? What 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 really you know satisfies you when you say that was a great purchasing experience? And more often than not, it's people using your name. It's people recognising that you're a return guest. It's nice to see you back again, Mr. Crawford. Uh, last time we had you sitting over here tonight, we've got you this seat in the window. Wow, mm -hmm. you know. And, and we're all human beings and, and we like to be touched in that way. I'll go back to that restaurant next week if I've had that service. Yeah, so the, the research says that we, uh, that the experiences are what people respond to more and they're willing to spend a lot more money on. So if you're buying a, a new iPhone or a pair of sneakers or you know some, some sort of a product, um, your response to purchasing that experience and um, that engagement is just so so much stronger than getting a whatever. So uh, from what you were saying as well, something to take note of is getting giving away a free bottle of wine, meh. the personal touch with somebody. Um, the, the one that I've seen recently uh, done more and more is the free happy hour for an hour, right? So it's probably worth the same as a bottle of wine, but now you're actually interacting with the guest and you're seeing them and you're giving them some sort of an experience and you've done the same thing but you've just took them out of their room into a common area right and then they're excited and then they might buy even more drinks so so you do well anyway out of it so um that's something that's really important with loyalty programs is that we think of it like creating the experience not just freebies or 10 percent offs and things like that i don't think that they're as effective as to, to maintain that loyalty would you would you agree with that thinking yeah i do i think you have to be careful that you're not seen to be just giving stuff away to to woo the customer because that that kind of cheapens the entire platform mm. so one, one of the technical things we do we the the app the mobile phone app the marriott bonvoy app is the most user-friendly i'm not a technical person but i love it it's got like a, a fuel gauge at the top that shows you how many nights you've stayed and you know it's easy to use it's easy to book shows you your history technically it's great for receipts and making sure your pa is on top of all the stage you've had it's just great so i think giving someone a tool that that is that is wrapped up and connected to that loyalty program um, is is sort of the tangible way that you make it happen because next time they go to book it's on their phone they know how to use it they're watching that gauge go up of how many nights uh, they've stayed and that's that's well beyond this idea of just giving them something on check-in and i think hotels are pretty good at this you know we we all check into our room and there's a note in our room from the general manager you know i i hate to see um, those notes that are just template typed things um, that that to me is a fail because it is not genuine it's it, it actually works against the whole concept so you've taken the time to put a note in my room uh, but you haven't used my name and it's not hand it's not hand signed now this is the old-fashioned part of me coming out right yeah, yeah. but imagine that note handwritten that mentions that we note that it's your birthday next week mr crawford and whatever but uh, or we note that you're traveling on leisure for this weekend as opposed to your previous corporate stay we hope you have time to enjoy this bottle of wine that you mentioned the bottle of wine is still a good thing <laughs> people still want it people still like those things but it's how you deliver it and it's that recognition of the personalization that i think is is the magic yeah and um i think well, our time is, is moving very quickly um so i'm only going to ask a couple more questions um just to tie tie things off um when we've got uh, the um, the staffing, right? So we've got obviously we're building the loyalty program, and we've got thing you know, we're building loyalty, and and I think the the one nice thing that's come out of this episode is we we've talked about loyalty programs and Marriott Bonvoy, and now we say, well, yeah, there's that, but it's all on the foundation of loyalty um, that, that you said that comes from Mr. Marriott, right? We that's one yeah. of our root core values, and it's important to us. Um, then, so you've got all the, the technical stuff and then you've got your staff um, that you need to train and kind of have them inducted in, in, in that philosophy, right? So that goes beyond all the technical stuff. That's all, also the way that you actually train people. It is, and that's where the whole thing can fall over. Let's be honest. You know, we can talk, uh, we can have a business plan that says this is how it works. I can talk to you today about the value of loyalty and how it all works. But if it doesn't flow through to the guest experience every single time, uh, then you put the entire structure at risk. 
And when I had my little hotel, and which was you know, the black, size, black tie service with a blue jeans attitude story, I made sure that I did an induction, though I didn't work at the hotel, I had a fantastic general manager who, who lived and breathed my vision. But I would absolutely every month go and make sure that I sat down with all the new staff and talked about the things that were important to me and what made the hotel different, why the prime minister would stay with us one night and the GM would dine with him, but the GM would go surfing with another guest who was on their, uh, you know, the, 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 who was on their most expensive holiday ever the next morning. And this, this flexibility and this, this idea and understanding that we're in the hospitality business and every guest is in our hotel for a different reason. Uh, that, that to me is where uh, I think empathy comes from, understanding comes from, and genuine authentic customer service comes from because it's customer focused. Uh, each one of those people I just described needs something different from us. And if we don't recognize that, uh, then, then we fail. And if we don't look someone in the eye and check in and use their name and smile, everything I've just said, this entire global investment that we're putting into a loyalty program is at risk of people saying, well, why am I a card carrying member mm. when that's the service I get? And that's the risk to all companies. Uh, when you go out on a limb and say, stick with us because we've got you, uh, one fail uh, can undermine that entire promise. Gotcha. And so I would be remiss not to go into the final part of, uh, of what I wanted to ask you about. And that's um, just around sort of return on investment, um, the, the money side of things, the, the, the juicy part that I think a lot of people want to know about and hear about. Uh, you mentioned that you get 50% of, um, of clients being uh, Bonvoy clients or guests. Um, does that mean is if they're a Bonvoy guest, you're saying they're not using an OTA to book? Um, is, that, is that that kind of metric or is it they're using the OTA as well as? It's, it's a great question, Bart, because this is the real magic. Um, at, at the moment, something like 74% of married international bookings globally come direct through our own channels, right? That might be the app that I spoke about, the website, our call centers. And that is, that is an enormous number because it means our reliance on third party aggregators and OTAs is, is less prolific than if you were a standalone hotel trying to take your single hotel to the world, uh, often 50% of your business would come from those online travel agents. Now they have an important role to play and we have an excellent relationship with those third parties because they're a very important part of our business mix. But we've recognized we don't want it to be 50% of our business. We want it to be a certain percentage of our business. Any good hotel has, has a sound wagon wheel of business mix. Online travel agents represents a part of it, but the bulk of it should be direct channels uh, to be to be successful because the cost of sale uh, is what matters. I often say anyone can fill a hotel, anyone. I, I did it and I had no, no idea how to, about hotels. It was called the internet. You put your rooms online and you sell them. The art form and the skill and the science to all of hotel success is the average room rate you can command for that room. So selling it's easy, but getting the premium is the hard bit. Uh, then there's the cost of sale bit. Where do you get your business from? If it's costing you 25% every time, or 30% every time you sell a room, that's, that's an enormous, enormous part of your business if the mix is, is out of whack. You can imagine a publican uh, at a hotel if he was losing 30% on every beer that he poured, uh, that's the profit gone. So you need to monitor that. Loyalty is the Trojan horse, if you like, of getting people to connect with you directly. And if it's 74% of your business coming direct to your website or your phone center or your app, that's a very, very good financial outcome. But I will touch on the cost, right? Because this, this loyalty thing does yeah. not come for free. Yeah, yeah. Our, our model is quite simple. Every time a hotel guest, a Bonvoy guest stays at one of our hotels, uh, three or 4%, depending on the brand, three or 4% of the room charge goes into a pot of money. And if you've got a million guests every night, and we know that say half a million of those are loyalty members, three or 4% of that is going into a pot of money. Now that's not a profit center, but what it does is that huge pot of money that's building up over time is what's used to fund the redemption nights when that loyalty member goes to stay at uh, the Ritz-Carlton Bora Bora, or St. Regis Bora Bora, I should say, 
there isn't a Ritz Carlton yet, but we're trying. Um, St. Regis Bora Bora, then that's not a free room night because we don't own that room. Our hotel owner owns that room. So out of that pot of money, we pay the hotel owner uh, out of those three and four percent that we've collected to pay an amount for that room for the guest who is paying nothing. And that's the circular beauty of how it works. Of course, a component of that pot of money then goes to do things like sponsor Manchester United Football Club, um, to sponsor the Australian Open, and then the, the, the logos get put on, um, the hoarding around the stadium, and all these things happen, and it perpetuates interest in the brand. And our hotel owners benefit from that because people see the brand up in lights, everyone wants to be a part of it, and the, the cycle continues. Yeah, so fascinating, fascinating to to hear about that pool of money going back in, um, at like a, a percentage cost or a percentage um, uh, amount that that's going to go back to reinvest, and it's kind of like a marketing pool for you guys um, to, to to run that program. Uh, for a small business, two to three percent is that the right number, or do they do we need to go a little bit harder because we're small and we we're not going to have that leverage of of, of volume. Yeah, look, it, it might it might be five percent, but I, I don't know. But if you were to start with a blank piece of paper and a and a twenty room hotel, and you wanted to create a loyalty program, I'd be putting a little bit and call it five percent uh, into that loyalty fund, if you like. And then over time, because you're not you're not going back to give everyone that stayed something, right? Mm. You, you every one every, one in every hundred people perhaps is going to get something from you, whether you use that fund to mm. to uh, give them a reward, pay for the dinner, give them a free room night. So I think it's, it, it can be notional as well. It, it, it's almost, it's not necessarily a cash in, cash out um, yeah. bookkeeping exercise. It can be a notional, but in your mind, if you're, if you're setting it up, I think that's, that's sort of the amount. 3%, you know, remember in the old days, people say, you know, contribute 3% to marketing. But now I'm sure that was 30 years ago. I'm sure it's not 3%, but maybe a loyalty program, you know, is 5% and it's notional. And you know somehow you need to re-engage re with your customer base to that extent. Um, and how you do it, as I said before, use your imagination, but um, sky's the limit. Beautiful, look, um, I think that brings us to, to the end of the episode. So uh, is there any other points or anything else you wanted to raise before we uh, close this one out or are we, we good to go? No, look, I, I think, I hope we've covered things that are of interest to your audience, but um, Hotel World's, a, it's been a challenging time. I think it would be remiss of us not to acknowledge that, but wow, travel's back. Uh, it's so exciting, you know, the year before COVID, I had 110 flights, I think. And, you know, I will never travel to that extent again. And I think a lot of the world won't, a lot of corporates will, will, won't travel to that extent, but it's enjoyable to be back on planes again. Uh, it's great seeing full restaurants and full airports. We're having, we will have a record year at some of our properties in Australia. In 35 years of operation, this year will be the biggest year ever. How remarkable and when you consider uh, how tough it was. So, you know, a shout out to everyone in operations land uh, because I'm not in that world. And I know you guys did it really, really tough um, at, at the coalface. Mm. Every time I walked into one of our hotels and sometimes I got a feeling I was more in a hospital than I was a hotel. None of us signed up to that. And, yeah. and it, it was really tough. <clears throat> we were the only international operator not to close any hotels in Australia. Uh, we had a lot of quarantine hotels. Um, our resorts actually did well because between lockdowns, people just flocked to them and wanted to sit sure. by the pool or get room service. So we, we saw, we learned a lot through COVID. There's a couple of themes happening. People, the renaissance of domestic travel is genuine. It is a real thing in Australia. I was in uh, Northern Territory last week and gosh, it was good to be there. And I remember in the 90s when the Germans came and Kakadu was a brand and, you know, everything was amazing up there. That's going to come back, right? That's going to come back for sure because people are holidaying at home. They're, they're not yet ready to, to really um, explore the world perhaps like they did before. But Australia will be first and they're spending more money than ever. And uh, I, I don't know, I'm just, I feel, I feel really excited because we're out of what was a really difficult time, um, a really difficult time. And when you've got 800,000 staff in our business, you know, we had, sadly, we had staff, many staff who passed away because of COVID, many guests who passed away because of COVID. Yeah. And, and those conversations mean so much more than the financial impact. Um, and, and it's not lost on our business. You know, we, we now see though, um, that, that that dark time is behind us. 
and we're seeing some really, really exciting um, things happening in our industry. And uh, personally, it's kind of in a really odd way rejuvenated me. Uh, and I'm, I'm excited to do more deals, bring more brands across Australia and, uh, and elsewhere. And, yeah. and I hope that today has been of some benefit to your audience. Oh, look, 100% has been a benefit. There's just so many tidbits, so many takeaways, so much experience that, that you have. And uh, what I love about this show is we can put a lens on from different angles. Um, and everyone's got their own experience uh, in life. Um, and they can generally, if they've got passion about whatever they're doing, they'll generally have something really clever and interesting to say and, and pass pass along. And um, from the position where you said it's it's incredibly invaluable. So thanks a lot for taking the time um, for joining us and uh, for, for getting on the accommodation show. We really do appreciate it. For anyone that's listening, make sure that uh, you give us a like, give us a follow. Um, it means a lot. It lets us bring awesome guests like Richard onto the show. Um, make sure that if you have not stayed at a Marriott mm -hmm. um, hotel that you check it out, download the app, um, get, in, get engaged, get involved um, and see what they're doing because it's, it's really clever stuff. Um, thank you once again for joining us. I do really appreciate it. My pleasure, Bart. Take care. Cheers. Take care. Have a good day.